So let's get to some, some descriptives, kind of the meat of how researchers think about and how we quantify play. Because play as a concept is really hard to define. It's like, you know it when you see it, but like what makes something play that's not? Playing Monopoly is play. I would say that's definitely play. You know, going outside and skipping rope is play, but what is it that's exactly like, what makes that exactly play and not make it work? And we'll talk about some ways in which we might generally describe these things, but it's still very fuzzy. But we do know that if we're gonna talk about play-based learning, that it is a pedagogical approach that emphasizes play to promote learning. So I say it's a pedagogical approach, which is kind of nonsense words, but it's really saying that this is a general view that you can put onto any curriculum, any philosophy you have, to think about how you want to instruct. It's not saying this is the way you want to do it. It's a lens in which you can look at what kids are doing and say, is that engaging? Is that hands-on? Is that active? Is that authentic to how kids learn? So play-based learning, importantly, is not just play. So play, in general, does not necessarily lead to learning. So just to think that my kids are enjoying themselves and having fun, that doesn't mean that they're learning. So we need to be critical of ourselves to say, just because they're enjoying themselves, are they really learning? What are they getting out of this? So as teachers, we always do instruction planning with the goal in mind. What is the skill I want them to learn, and how do I get them there? Well, that's the same thing that's true with play-based learning. You want to think about what is the goal that I want them to have? Is it that they're becoming more curious? Is it that they're problem solving? Is it that they're cooperating? Is it that they're learning basic understanding of number sense? Is it that they're learning how to understand that reading happens from left to right in the English language? Whatever that goal is, we still have to have that. And then you want to think, are they reaching that goal? Because just because it's play doesn't mean they're going to be getting where they want to go. Do you give them the language to identify that's the, the outcome? Meaning like, do you, give, do you yeah. tell them yep. you're doing this, the purpose of this is? No. So I mean, that's always helpful, but at some point it's just exploration of material. So your job is really to just create the environment and try to give them an authentic experience to construct on their own. So the kids don't always have to know like what is the purpose of what I'm doing. But if you as a teacher, you always want to know the purpose of what you're doing and have an idea of how you know the kids are actually getting there. So how to assess that. Yeah, how do you want to assess that? Because assessment's really important. And assessment's not like sitting them sit down and do worksheets. It's just observing them and being like, oh, look, he understood. Like, now they're putting that together and documenting that with just like, I love classrooms that just do post-it notes in the centers to say, okay, yep, that happened. I'm going to put a post-it note down so that when I think about giving parents feedback, I know that they've met that skill. Uh, taking a photo is a great way of documenting it as well. Yeah. Um, so while I said play doesn't necessarily lead to learning, you do want to know that learning is fundamental to play-based learning. So always keeping in mind what you want them to learn. It could be a developmental skill, it could be an academic skill. There's just something that you want them to learn. Okay. So another way you can think about this is that it's a developmentally appropriate strategy because it's authentic, it's age-based, it's the right thing, it's how kids learn. And it can be integrated with any mandated academic standard. So we can pull our common core standards off the shelf and if we have time, which I don't think we're going to, but I will challenge you to do this at home, is take that standard and think about how you can create an activity that is play-based. Because any standard, should be able to have that element labeled on, uh, layered onto it. This is not something additional you have to do. It's just thinking about how might I tweak that activity to make it a little bit more hands-on engaging. And you're already calling out exactly the things that you would do to make things more authentic and engaging. You just gotta be able to also convey that to other people, why what you're doing is helping reach that goal. So being able to say, well, why are you sending your kids outside? Like, what is that doing them? And you're like, well, they are out there collecting, making collections, so they're learning to sort and organize things upon common things. They're able to understand that these are the leaves and that they're alive, or they were alive until they fell off the tree. These are the acorns that are, serve as the basis for the life system to make that tree that's gonna make those leaves that are gonna fall off. And there's the squirrel that, you know, like all those pieces, how they fit together. So it's not, it's a hard thing for teachers because we also have to justify we know what we're doing, but we also have to justify to other people what we're doing and why that's important. On top of all the developmental skills they're learning by going outside. So it can be integrated. It's not something new, it's just another extension. 
Uh, and as I previously said, really play is, a, is an essential component of the vast majority of early childhood curriculums, and that is a part of many educational philosophies. So if you're somebody who studies a Montessori philosophy, that idea of setting up centers and allowing kids to explore at their own pace is essential to the heart of Montessori. Reggio, uh, which is our ch uh, child development center at UNH, the CSDC as we call it, that's the philosophy of them. It's all about inquiry and investigation. So we create an idea, we help kids explore and investigate. So that hands-on active learning process is essential. Uh, there are many curriculums that do this. So I was talking about building blocks is one of the curriculums for early childhood. And there's a lot of activities that are games. So we're playing a modified version of shoots and ladders, right? So that we can learn about uh, doing number counting, right? So it's kind of, it's already there. We just need to figure out and highlight it more in our curriculum. Okay, but what this means then, because you'll see that a lot of this is about active and hands-on learning, one thing that you're going to keep in mind, going back to that fact I said that classrooms that had more center time versus those that had less center time had kids that learned more, much of this play-based stuff happens in small groups and in center time. It's really hard to do whole group and make it as active and hands-on as you want. Now there are opportunities. Hands, whole group is fundamental. If there's a piece of information that everybody in your class needs to know, you're not going to go around and tell every kid individually. You're going to put them in a whole group and you're going to say, okay, yesterday at the playground, we didn't, we were having a hard time making friends, right? So let's have a conversation of what it means to be a friend. That's a perfect thing that you need to do. So play isn't to say that you don't ever do whole group. It's just thinking about when's the purpose of doing whole group and when can you do something in a more hands-on discovery way. So when you think about play-based learning, we can really think of it as a continuum. So on one end is child-directed free play. This can be all kinds of different things, right? This could be I set up the centers and I just walk away and you're, you've got your manipulatives, you've got your uh, drama center, and I'm letting you direct it. You can go wherever you want with it. I don't have any preconceived idea of what you're going to get out of that. I don't care that you're not counting the manipulatives in the uh, kitchen, right, and saying how many slices of pizza does everybody have. That's not my goal. My goal is just for you to have that environment and you make of it what you want. So that's one end where it's really just, I've set the environment and it's for the kids. But then we want to go into the learning base kind of stuff. The stuff where you're like, I have an academic goal in mind and I want my kids to reach that goal. So we want to do something that can be what we call guided play. So this is play, but you're guiding it now. It's not just child directed, but this is saying, I've got a goal in mind and I'm going to push them to get that goal. It tends to be an academic goal. Whereas this is more of those kind of developmental skills that we can think about. And this could be something that's completely directed by you. I pull open my common core standards and I know I need to work on reaching, com I want to work on this standard. Uh, or it can be mutually directed. So this is a shared endeavor between what the kids' interests are and then what kind of academic skills you want to layer onto something that kids are driving. So you're kind of constructing that, that lesson together. But you can really think of a child-directed Free play is more open-ended and kind of really more flexible and on the shoulders of kids of where things go. And then the guided play, you're more guiding it, which makes sense because it's called guided play. 